I looked around and I thought the perfect railroad for us is Burlington Northern. Both Western railroads, they're northern tier, we're southern tier. They have all this uh, grain and coal business. We have this premier franchise, intermodal, in, in, intermodal franchise in, in, in the United States. And uh, there's not a lot of overlap. Should be easy to get it approved. And so that's when I started talking to Jerry Greenstein. And I guess that was in 93. Yeah. So you initiated that with him? Yeah. And I, what I found out later, you know, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't just all over it and jumping all over to do it. But I found out later from Mike Yanni, who was one of the kind of pillar board members on, on BN, that they weren't happy with uh, the way the road was, was running. And so Ben Love and Yanni and uh, Danny Davison, who had run the U.S. Trust Company, I think, went to see Grinstein and said, Jerry, we want you to find somebody else to run the company. And he said, are you firing me? And he said, and, and they said, no, we're just telling you to get somebody else to run the company. And so a merger with Santa Fe was a way for that to happen. But I also found out that he called up Dick Davidson and said, you want to be the CEO of Burlington Northern? And uh, Davidson was about ready to take the job. And then the UP board found out about it. So they hustled him into a, a position to take over for, from Drew Lewis. And so now Rinstein had to go back to the <laughs> to merging with the Santa Fe. And we finally agreed to it. And uh, so we announced that. Um, let's see. We announced that on June 30th, 1994. And what was interesting was the Drew Lewis. Yeah. Inter well, see, I called, I called all the CEOs and gave, gave them a fair warning that we were going to do this. And, uh, you know, originally, I guess maybe Lewis called me because the rumors, gone, well, this took a long time to get done and the rumors mm -hmm. were everywhere. And Lewis said, it's fine with me. I like competition. I'm not going to get in your way. Well, okay. So we announced it on... June 30, 1994, and on October 5th, Drew Lewis called me up and said, I want to buy the Santa Fe. And I said, well, Drew, we, we have a contract to sell it to Burlington Northern. He said, well, you better listen to me because if you don't, you're just going to read about it. So I said, okay. He said, I'll, I'll be in your office at two o'clock in the afternoon in Schaumburg. And I called Bob Hellman, who is my chief legal advisor, and he came running out and we, we, we hashed out what we were going to say. And it was going to be, Hellman was going to start out by saying, you know, we have a contract to sell the Santa Fe Railroad, but we have a financial responsibility to our shareholders to get the best price and we have an out in the contract if we had a better offer. So here comes, at least we're standing up and we're looking down at the front of the building and these two black limousines pull up and Lewis gets out and Davidson comes along and he gets out. I guess he came from Omaha and Lewis came from Pennsylvania. And they come up in the elevator and as they walk in the room, all of a sudden we, it smells like we're in a gin shop. And like this is two o'clock in the afternoon and uh, I, every indication was Lewis had uh, was under pre trip himself. Yes. And uh, so it starts out and uh, Hellman says, Drew, you know we have a contract to sell the Santa Fe to Burlington Northern. But, and before he can get to the second half of the sentence, Lewis stands up, takes out an envelope from his breast pocket, throws it on the table and says, you're making a big mistake, I'll pay 20 bucks a share. And with that, he turns around and walks out. Walks around my desk, I had this great big long desk, you know, it's a conference table-like desk. And and uh, Davidson is sitting there. And finally, Davidson gets up and as he walks out, he goes, you know, he sticks his head back in and says, bye. <laughs> so, and that so was then, it. So then I open the envelope and it's like $14 a year or something. And... Uh, so that was that. Uh, so I, I told Jerry right away. And, but the offer, I think, was a little bit more than uh, 
yeah, maybe it was 17 bucks a share, but it was, it was a little bit more than UP's offer, I think. A little bit more than BN's offer. Um, and so I, I told uh, Grinstein, and uh, they decided to up their offer because we'd done enough preliminary information and uh, uh, studies by then that we knew we were going to save a lot more money and that the BN could actually pay more money. Then what was the strategy for UP to make that offer? It's not, it wasn't a particularly good fit. There's a lot of overlap in some of the major corridors and so forth. I'll tell you what happened. I think uh, uh, a guy by the name of John Burns was running Allegheny Corporation. Allegheny had been in and out of railroads. I think they owned the Missouri Pacific at one time. Um, and they uh, and they owned a couple million shares of stock in Santa Fe, and they thought we were selling it cheap. So they called up Dick David and said, you ought to buy the... the uh, the BN's getting away with murder here. You ought to buy it. And then the UP started looking at it, and I guess they decided, why not? Um, but it was a you know, pretty overlapping merger, and it would have had a heck of a time getting approved at the ICC or later Surface Transportation yeah. Board. Um, so anyway, that's what they did. And then Davis, or then right in the middle of it, uh, Lewis exited the scene because he had to go to some rehabilitation place. And uh, we, we, the way Fred Fairley described it, it was it was like we, the uh, BN and the UP pay, played uh, tennis with each other, and Santa Fe was the ball. <laughs> we just keep going back and forth, and finally I made a deal with Burns and another guy who had a pretty good stake in the company that we made an offer, and not only would the exchange or the price that that the exchange rate produce a better price, but if over time the company was doing well while we were going through the merger, we would use our cash to buy more stock, which would make the stock that they eventually get more valuable. And uh, so we worked all that out, and then they, we were, you know, they were we were going to go on a, to a proxy fight, and I was out running around the country trying to get all these uh, in, institutional investors to vote for us when my my admin calls me, I'm, I'm changing planes in O'Hare, and reads me this letter a, a week before the shareholder vote that the UP has given up. So that was that. Oh, and the other interesting thing is, I, while all this was going on, I got a call from Anschutz. And he said, Robert, I want to have, I want to have uh, lunch with you. I'm going to fly into O'Hare, and will you meet me at the uh, Hilt Hyatt Hotel and uh, have lunch? I said, sure, I'll do it. And we sit down, he says, I want to buy the Burlington Northern. But this time he owns SP. I want to buy Burlington Northern and I want you to come be the CEO. And I said, Phil, first of all, that's the two crummiest railroads on the West. <laughs> and you're going to let the, the you're, then they're going to be fighting the, the two best railroads. That's just not going to work. Plus, I'm not, I'm not going to let something happen that is not good for my shareholders. I'm going to take the best deal. And so that's, that was the end of that. So he just backed off yeah. from there. Well, that's interesting that he didn't have more, more fight in him than that. Yeah. Was it just a gambit, you think, to see if you had an interest in coming over to be with him? Or? Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it, a lot of things had to happen to make it work. You know, they... The uh, first of all, the UP Santa Fe deal would have to be approved, and I mean that was that was one of the reasons why. I mean, I, I kept just telling the UP, we're willing to sell you the Santa Fe, but we're not gonna we're not gonna put our shareholders in jeopardy. So if you want to pay for it up front, and put it in trust. That's fine. If you don't want to do that, we think that the odds of approval are a, a, you know, a great danger for our shareholders and we're not going to sit there and wait to see what happens regardless of what you say you're going to pay because i really don't think it could have been approved without giving away an awful lot maybe giving away so much that it wouldn't have been worth doing or how long it would have taken I mean, think about the up trying to buy the rock island and how what yeah. happened with that yeah that was 10 years and yeah. ended up in bankruptcy nothing yeah, yeah. 
So, so now the deal gets done with BN. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And you go to Fort Worth as CEO. Well, the deal was I was supposed to go there as a CEO and Jerry was supposed to be the non-executive chair. I was going to be president and CEO. So I called up Grinstein. I waited. I waited until our shareholders approved, both shareholders approved the merger and the ICC approved the merger. And then I called Jerry up one day and I said, hey, you know, we're going to get together here. You've got the right to appoint, I think, two thirds of the board and I want to meet your board members. And if you just give me their phone numbers or how I can contact them, I'll go around and talk to each one of the board members. I didn't know any of them. He said, all right, let me think about that. And he called me back and said, you don't have to do that. There's going to be a meeting this Sunday in Dallas and they'll all be there to meet you. So that was... <sighs> It was in August of 1995. I don't remember the exact date. And the, um, so I, I was up in Wisconsin. I think I got picked up on an uh, executive jet and flown down to Dallas the night before. And Sunday morning I get up. Fortunately, I was smart enough to at least have a tie on and a blazer. And I, as I walked down and there were all these uh, BN board members in their coat and ties and there's a formal boardroom set up with all their black binders and everything and uh, this wasn't just to get to know credits this was a real board meeting and they looked at me you know, a little funny like well, you know, what are we going to do with you and uh, finally they said asked me if I would sit down and have breakfast with them and I said sure and I think Rinstein wasn't around and so uh, they didn't know why you were there no, they knew I was there. They just didn't know I was supposed to be there at that time. Oh, you know? okay. <laughs> and 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 they and, and I didn't know what what you know the whole reason why the meeting was called was because Grinstein wanted to get rid of me before he even I even had the job. So uh, I guess they must have called Gary and or Jerry in his hotel room and said, "Stay up there." And then they went into executive session, and uh, after about. 45 minutes or so, they called me in. And Ben Love, who had been the uh, CEO at Texas Commerce Bank, was the kind of the lead director, and he was running the meeting, and he said, now, first thing words out of his mouth were, uh, we're, Rob, we're all a fan of Rob Krebs. And I said, now, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, so Whitaker, uh, Ed Whitaker, who put AT&T back together, you know, he was sitting across the table from me, he said, what's all this crap about moving the headquarters to Chicago? You might have used a more, a stronger word than crap, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I work for you, I'll do whatever you want, but there's a great big operations center here in Fort Worth, that's where we're going to run the railroad, but there might be some staff functions like finance or something that would be better in Chicago. I'd just like to take a look and see. And then uh, Yanni asked me something about, well, okay, how how's the BN performing? And then my own little, I you know, I, I thought hospitable way or nice, nicely put, I said it wasn't working very well and it could be a lot better. Which they all agreed to. They wanted to know what, it, what they wanted to know what it, uh, I thought the operating ratio would be, and um, and then we talked about uh, how to slim down. And, and Barbara Jordan was sitting across from me, and uh, I made sure I said that you know we're, we're going to do this. We're all going to do this together, and we're not going to do this on the uh, backs of the people who work for the railroad. I'm sure that got her a boat, and. Uh, then they said, okay, thank you very much. You can go out. How long did that last? Right? Probably an hour. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sitting outside again with uh, Jerry's admin, who is just nervous as hell. Still no Jerry. And then Whitaker goes out, and he goes and gets in the elevator and goes up in the uh, hotel. And then he comes back down again and goes back in. And then they call me back in. And they say, uh, all right, uh, we're all for you being the president and CEO. And we have just a couple of things we'd like you to consider. We'd like, uh, we'd like Ben Love to be the chair of the executive committee, which will meet monthly. And we'd like Danny Davison to be a non-executive chair of the corporation. So how do you feel about that? 
And I said, well, I work for you. It's fine with me. Not a word about Greenstein. And then I think I flew back with Arlo Weber, who was the head of Northwestern University and was on the board. And you know, he said, that was a good meeting. It went well. And uh, I went back to Chicago and I got a call the next day from Jerry saying, I'm going to retire. So, okay. And so we took, well, I, I went there and I was very careful when we put the railroad together. I picked half the, of the senior people from BN, half the people from Santa Fe. I made sure that the head of the personnel department or human resources at BN uh, was very well liked by the uh, BN board members. And so I picked him to run the whole personnel thing. I really smoothed everything out. How did you pick when you go down the list of chief Position, senior executive positions. How did you? I mean, you probably you probably knew the Santa Fe people intimately. Did you mm -hmm. have a good feel for the BN people? And how did you make a decision between this guy for that or this guy for that? Uh, did well, you do first of all, did I, you do interviews with them? Did you? Yeah, did yeah, you sure. I, I talked to each one individually, and I said, "This is what I'm going to propose for you to do." Uh, I think I remember uh, I met Greg Swinton here in Chicago. Uh, and he, we made him the head of um, marketing for coal and grain, or for, it was for grain. And then when Anderson left, we gave him coal too. But um, I started with the premise it's going to be 50-50. I knew I wanted to have uh, McGinnis do operations. I knew I wanted to have Schultz do intermodal because Santa Fe was the intermodal railroad. Uh, Doug Babb, who had been the head of the law department, uh, I, I, I liked him. I trusted him. I, you know, I, I, I had confidence in him, so I made him my chief of staff. And then we put uh, Jeff Moreland in from Santa Fe as the general counsel. Um, John Anderson, who had run coal, was coal. I divided marketing up into these three different mm -hmm. leaders. Uh, that was about it, I guess. And, and the thing that really helped me was the, uh, the Burlington Northern had this great severance program. And it wasn't like you, you have to lose a job to take it. You can take it and uh, whether or not you were offered a job. So a lot of the, I never even said word one to a lot of the BN people. They, they were just fleeing. <laughs> and there was a few stayed behind. There was a guy, a uh, general manager, Mueller, who I made general manager of the Powder River Basin because I'd been on a train trip and, on a number of times and I met him and I thought there's a good guy. He knows what is, you know, is going on. And, and this severance thing that they had was it lasted for two years from the time of the merger. So here's Mueller. He's in charge of the Powder River Basin. And we got three big cold developments in a row. And I finally said to him, uh, why don't you get out there and find out what's going on and fix it? Instead, he just went home and phoned and said, I quit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was, that, uh, there was some, there was somebody said that not, not many people, uh, although Krebs was tough, not many people left him voluntarily. Well, there was one that did. Another guy was Mike Frankie, who had been the chief engineer at uh, Santa Fe, and one day he just quit. He didn't even bother to call me. Uh, he, he just walked out of the building. Mike was the general manager of the Chesapeake Western in Virginia when I was a trainee. It was a little short railroad that had three locomotives. Yeah. He was a uh, known iconoclast, I guess, of a young man at the time. And I think he got, that didn't fly well in Roanoke. So he was exiled to there. But, yeah. Uh, well, he was a good guy. I mean, he, uh, he did everything we ever asked of him. He put 150 million bucks building, putting Stampede Pass back up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and of course I was over on him all the time. You know, here's your budget. This is your timetable and get it done. And he did, but he was living over in Indiana and I don't think he never moved down to Fort Worth. Even when he was working in Chicago, he had a car that looked like a cop car with a whole bunch of radio antenna on it. <laughs> And every day he would drive over to Indiana at 90 miles an hour. You know, <laughs> he'd pass cops and they'd wave at him. And, and he, he just didn't, uh, he, he had a family life that was important to him. God bless him. And I guess that finally just, he couldn't make it both work. But I wish he just would have come into my office and said, Rob, we can't do this anymore. Yeah. 
Right. Understandable. So um, there were some notes that I was reading about when you took your son up to the Hyde School and that you participated in a session up there that had an impact beyond just the school with you. Do you care to comment on that at all? Yeah, well, two things happen. Um, that pretty much saved me from failure, I think. One of them was the Hyde School. So our son was uh, between his freshman and sophomore years. I know it must have been his sophomore and junior years in high school. He was the apple of Anne's eye. The kid could do no wrong, except when he start, when he did do wrong, he did big time. <laughs> During the summer between the, his sophomore and junior year, and uh, we, 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 there was a, a fellow who was a kind of a, a, a educational counselor that helped both uh, our youngest, our older son Robert, and Duncan, our youngest son, and he said. You ought to consider the Hyde School, uh, a boarding school in um, Bath, Maine. It's called Hyde because Mr. Hyde was the founder of General Dynamics and or, or the, of Bath Ironworks, which General Dynamics eventually bought and was one of the largest shipbuilders in the world during World War II. Um, and the school was in his old mansion. And a guy by the name of Joe Gauld had uh, he was your, your typical um, teacher coach at a boarding school and he woke up one day and said, you know, this is just all wrong. I'm teaching kids how to repeat meaningless facts that they forget when they take a test, when what a secondary education is all about is building character. So he quit and he started this high school. It was based on the premise that each one of us has our own unique potential and it is up to us to take the responsibility to develop that potential and that you can you can teach character and um, so he started the school and he, he got a lot of kids that needed some character and it all worked great except they went home for the summer and he lost them and then he brought them back again and he had to start all over with them so he said okay if you're going to have a kid at high school you parents will also participate and uh, we you know typical dummies we, we think high school is going to fix our kid, right? And um, we dumped him off there. We had our interview that we had to have, a mandatory interview. The family had an interview, just my wife and me and, and Duncan. Right? And we, we dropped his suitcase off in the, on the front porch of the dorm, went on a chartered jet and flew to Los Angeles so I could go to a meeting out there. And the, I found out two years later that the interviewer was walking down the hall after our interview and the wife of the headmaster was walking by and she said something about, well, how's the Krebs kid? And the interviewer said, Krebs kid's just fine. It's the old man who's all screwed up. So, <laughs> so we, go to, we go to the first, first meeting when, when, when we were there. It's, it's, all the families show up. And, you know, it's not your typical tailgate and you go to a football game or something. We walk in this room there's a circle of chairs. There's a Kleenex box on the floor in the, in the middle of the room. And uh, I said, what the hell is that? Somebody's going to trip over that. And then we're all sitting there with our kids. And we go around and everyone, the, the, the leader of this thing, facilitator is one of the teachers, says, okay, now we all have our issues. And what we're here to do is to get these issues out in the open. And there were people from all walks of life. And they got to us, and I said, we don't have any issues. We just got to have a kid. We need to get fixed. And they all looked at us like, who are you? Holy cow, you don't know anything. And so the, uh, they also had this FLC, uh, Family Learning Center, and you had to go individually with your kids, uh, with your kid for this uh, four-day session where you got into, you know, what, 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 what are the issues in your life? What is your background? What are you, I, mean, I and our, my, our wife went first, she came home in tears. She was in tears for a week because they kept telling her, you know, what, what are you doing with your life? You know, what are, are you living up to your potential? You know, and, and, and why aren't you? And uh, <laughs> so then uh, I went to mine and Joe Gauld was, was, he was the founder of this school. 
And he, uh, the man is a genius. He's like 94 years old now. Um, I have so much respect for him. Um, he, he tells the, the story when, when I was, when, because he came in and talked to us when I went to my FLC and, um, um, about when Malcolm, his son, who later became headmaster, first went to the school. I don't know how our time is doing here, but this is worth talking a lot. The, uh, and Malcolm is going to teach geography. And in the first day of class, he's walking across the field back to the mansion and he sees his dad and he's got all these papers in his hand. And he goes to his dad and he says, Dad, I don't know what we're doing here, but we, this is just not working. We don't have talent here. We don't have people you know, that we can even teach. And his dad said, well, I don't know, what do you mean? Let me see your papers. So the paper, at the diagram of the United States, and people were supposed to write in the states. And the most names that were written in were something like 43, and they included Israel and, and Denmark and places like that. And the very least that were filled in were two spaces, and that was Ohio and Maine. And so Joe pulls out this one and he says, now look at this, man. You think know, you got a lot, a lot you can work with here. Look at this guy. He said, well, daddy only knows two states. This was a, from an inner city school kid from Cleveland. He said, yep, but he knows where he's been and he knows where he's going. And that was the attitude Good. he had. And uh, so anyway, that rubbed off on me. I mean, I, 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 this thing about we must take responsibility for our lives. We, you know, our, we cannot control our kids. Our kids have to take their own responsibility. They have some sayings, when in doubt, bet on the truth, still in doubt, bet on more truth. The truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, and, and it got so, when I went back to uh, BNSF, all I had to do was walk into a meeting and say, the truth will set you free, and everybody else would say, but first it will make you miserable. Horrible. And uh, eventually 40,000 40, people at BNSF got a taste to hide. Uh, really? Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll, yeah, show you, I'll show you why in a minute. But... Well, I'm curious, before you do that, just your earlier comment was uh, about the Hall conversation about the kid's fine, it's the old man who is all screwed up. What did, was it that you said or did in that initial meeting that had him conclude that that was part of the issue? Just it's the fact that I showed up with it and dumping my kid on the doorstep there and saying, you're going to fix him and I'm sorry, I'm out of here. Got it. That was, that was, that was enough. That, that was a good hint. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and Joe Gauld helped me. I mean, he mentored me as I was going through this, this you know, trying to put this company with these disparate views and people who didn't like each other. Red team, and, green team. Yeah, kind of yeah thought they were crazy about you know, nobody. All the coal guys hated the intermodal people because they got locomotives and all the, the intermodal people hated the coal people because they got the locomotives. <laughs> and it was so... Uh, but he, he, he made me understand that my main job was to get people to want to and to help them express and achieve their unique potential for the good of themselves and also for the good of, of, of the institution that we all work for. And uh, because I was so used on the Santa Fe, I mean, I, I would get in my car my house was right over here across the ravine at the time, and I would drive to Schaumburg to go to work in the morning, and it would take me um, like 45 minutes to do it. And I would have a tape recording from every part of the railroad as to exactly what went on uh, that day while I was asleep. And, and in fact, what I had the uh, audio visual guys do was speed up the sound because I couldn't quite do it in 45 minutes, so they'd be talking a little faster than I knew what was going on. And, and I could call every shot, and I was kind of like King in a way, you know, the general manager or, or the yard master. Super train whatever. master. Yeah. Um, but you couldn't do it when you had 40,000 people and 25,000 miles of railroad, especially when nobody was on the same team. So, uh, so anyway, so that, that was high school. And then the other thing was the Aspen Institute. And Doug Babb, uh, God bless him, he, uh, I guess he asked me if I wanted to talk to them because this guy, Walter Papke, I think his name was, he came from Germany, he started, started packing, packaging Corporation of America, and he saw what happened to his native land and Hitler and 
World War II, and he said, you know, this should never happen in America. So he founded this Aspen Institute, and it was based upon the traits that make America or any, any community or civilization great. Liberty, equality, community, and efficiency. And so you would go to the Aspen Institute and you'd be there sitting with a guy from General Motors and a guy from General Foods and all the top executives and you would do these readings and you would read about Plato and Aristotle and Machiavelli and Martin Luther King Jr. And you would, uh, you would search for what the meaning of liberty, equality, community, and efficiency was. And then at the end of that thing, you would get divided up into separate little groups and everybody would pick one of those people they had read from and then explain to the rest of the group why that person should be the CEO of your company. And uh, so they explained all that to me and I said, yeah, I think it's worthy. I, I'd, I'd like to do that with, uh, with my senior management team. I said, um, no, no, you're going to be with people from General Motors and General Electric and everything. that's going to be really good. I said, no, no, that's not what I want to do. I want my senior management team there because we're trying to build a team and I want the spouses. So, oh, yeah, the spouses can come to ask and they'll love to shop. It's great. You know? <laughs> so I said, no, no, I want the spouses to be there and be in the meeting. Because I thought I mean, there's all this pillow talk going on. You know, what's Cribs doing? I'm mean, right. telling everybody they, you know, this is a whole new world for people. We're responsible. We have to get these things done. Um, and uh, they said, okay, sure, they can come to the meeting. And so I had them set out, send out two binders to each uh, family: one to the office, to the, the executive, and one home to the spouse. And uh, and then we all showed up one day to start this program. I think there were probably six or seven couples. Did you do it in Aspen or did you do it in Fort Worth? No, Aspen. We went to Aspen. Yeah. And we, uh, so we show up and there's this table, we're on the table and there's about seven chairs and then there's a bunch of chairs back around the outskirts or the, the wall of the, of the room. And I said, no, 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 this is not the way we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We want everybody at the table. So well, we never done that. I said, well, fine, we'll just wait here until you get a bigger table and you can figure out how you're going to do it. And we did that. And everybody was involved. And so what we ended up with, it, it took a couple, uh, a couple more steps. But we ended up with this little book, Vision and Values. And because what we did is we talked during the day about liberty, equality, community, and efficiency. And then in, in, then everybody went out and if it was the winter, they went skiing. If it was the summer, they went hiking or whatever. And, uh, so we did this with, I think, five different groups because it was so powerful with the first layer. We went down to the second layer and did all of them too. I guess it was three more meetings. Ann and I went to all of them. And, um, the, and how many days were you there? Uh, it was like three days, I think four nights, maybe. But not only did we go through liberty, equality, community, and efficiency, but then in the afternoon, the, uh, the, the execs came back and we talked about what kind of company do we want? What style? What shared values do we want? Um, what's the mission of the company? And we had a guy from Stanford Business School lead that discussion. So when we got all done, each one of these groups had, this is the style, this is what our shared values are, this is what liberty, equality, community, efficiency mean. And then finally, what are the evidences of success? Mm -hmm. In other words, how will we know that, that we, what we did, right. we really did. And, and then we, we, all right, so we had, we had four different versions of this thing. And then Bab also was smart enough to hire John Locke, professor of leadership from the Harvard Business School. I didn't know you could be a professor of leadership. So we had all the, the, the senior execs who had been to these four sessions and we were hammering out one version that would become what BNSF was. And it was just a mess. I mean, we you still had the coal guys bitching about the intermodal guys. And, and uh, I, mean, I remember standing up and saying, I've never seen a company so screwed up in my life. And Locke is just standing there, you know, <laughs> what the hell? And uh, so he says, uh, and Harvard Business School professors never tell you anything. You know, it's all case study. You have to figure it all out yourself. But he finally said, okay, I've had enough. There are three overriding questions. The first one is, should be an intermodal railroad or a coal and grain railroad? 
The second one is, should we be centralized or decentralized? And the third one is, should Krebs be Mary Poppins or Darth Vader? And he said, I'm going to tell you the answer to those questions, but first I want everybody to stand up and raise your right hand and repeat after me. I will never say the B word or the S word again because that's BS. And then he said, okay, intermodal versus coal, you're going to be both. You've got a great big railroad, you've got different lines and different places where, where, where the business is, and the more business you put on the railroad, the more money you're going to make. Centralized or decentralized, you've got a computer system, you can be centralized, but you also can, you, the people in the field can know what's going on and become part of that system and they can put their responsibility out on the field. And as far as Krebs being Darth Vader or Mary Poppins, take Jack Welch. He's a wonderful, warm guy. If you don't work well for his company, he'll find you a job somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. That's what, that's what put the railroad together. Wow. Can you see that? Yeah. Well, that's, that's, insightful stuff. Did the, did that continue as people transitioned through jobs? Did you go back and... Oh, absolutely. I tell you what, that went out to 40,000 people. And we went around and we had town hall meetings. I you know, personally went around to, to BN sites. And before he, uh, he started this thing, uh, this guy, John Locke, he showed us two videos. One of Borman, who ran Eastern Airlines, yeah. at the time they got ready to get saying, you will have to do this, and we will have to cut this, and we will do this. And the other one was SAS, and they put a little pamphlet like that together with pictures and cartoons, and they said, this is what's going to happen in deregulation, and this is how we're going to have to respond, and this is what's coming, and this is how the way we all have to work together. And uh, so we kind of copied that SAS thing in a way. But yeah, I, I went up to town hall meeting one time. I went to uh, the old headquarters of the GN and NP in uh, St. Paul. And I walked into a theater, downtown theater, and there were probably uh, 400, 500 people because that was the headquarters, the clerical headquarters of the railroads. And these clerks had jobs for life. And there were people with red T-shirts, uh, union T-shirts outside, handing out leaflets saying, the seven reasons why you should not believe President Krebs. They never met me. They hadn't, I hadn't said a word. So I go in there, we have this knockdown, drag out meeting. I held this thing up and said, how many of you people have seen this? I got a few hands. I said, you better read it because it is the Declaration of Independence. It is the Constitution. And it is the Bill of Rights of this country. And if you ever want to know why we do something, it's all right here. I mean, I'm, I, it's, I'm still emotional about it. Take community. BNSF is a community of over 40,000 mutually dependent members. Each one of us depends on BNSF for our livelihood. And through our collective efforts, BNSF depends on us to defend, sustain, and strengthen our community. Uh, and we had little quotes from people. Yeah, I'd rather go yeah. ahead. The uh, style. As a community, we're tough-minded optimists, decisive yet thorough, open and supportive, confident and proud of our success. A little quote, uh, quote from Chris Everett, you got to take initiative and play your game. In a decisive set, confidence is the big difference. We got a quote from Roy Disney. We got a quote from Henry Ford. We got a quote from Thomas Jefferson. Um, equality, as a member of the BNSF community, I can expect to be treated with dignity and respect to be given equal access to tools, training, and development opportunities, and have equal opportunity to achieve my full potential. You know where full potential came from. So, so anyway, and, and just little by little, that, that kind of brought the road together. It didn't hurt that we spent billions of dollars buying locomotives. And it took a couple of years before we didn't have to hold a train for power. I, and one year I called up the guy running uh, the GE uh, locomotive division and said, I want to buy 500 locomotives. That was a billion dollars right there. And we painted them all. I, I, I picked a color. I, I used the, the war bonnet Santa Fe design, but I, I did it in green and orange because that was great northern or northern Pacific. So everybody had something yeah. that was part right. you know, of their, 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 their past companies. Yeah, so. that's... So... so impactful helps transition into the modern era then 
UP goes out and buys SP, mm -hmm. and you get to relive the Houston scenario from afar this time as it <laughs> melts down again. Right. How did that affect? Did, did you did you, did Davidson call you for any counsel on how you fixed it the first time, or were they? I offered. I I went down there with uh, Breedenberg and Buck Horde and met him in Houston, and we told him uh, what, what, what had to be done, and we told him what the mistakes were, and we told him what we went through, and we even gave him some locomotives, even though our business was up 10% because <clears> nobody <throat> could ship on the UP, and we were hurting. It didn't make a lot of difference. So we get to the end. Um, things are going fairly well there, and you've decided that you're going to move on to retirement of sorts, um, maybe not as soon as you'd planned, but. Oh yeah, I, well, I planned I was gonna retire at 55 and then the merger came along and then I said, I'm gonna retire at 60. But in the meantime, you know, we tried to do, and I went to uh, see Arnold no, to, uh, Good at this time to see if he wouldn't merge with Norfolk Southern with BNSF and he wouldn't do it, which broke my heart. That's probably the just biggest disappointment I have in 35 years of working on the railroad. Did you get, what do you understand why that he explained the? Uh, who's the guy that was his right hand, right arm and wrote a book a while ago? Jim McClellan? Yeah, passed away. Um, he said in his book something that really disturbed me and it was that they thought, because you know, when I went to Good. I said, this is a perfect opportunity. You got the uh, Southern Pacific Union Pacific merger in, in front of the Surface Transportation Board. You, you got uh, Conrail sitting up there and the CXX made the offer for it. There's no way they are gonna have a monopoly up there. You can get all kinds of stuff, trackers rights, you can get access to, to uh, the Northeast. And in the meantime, as they're CSX and Conrail are getting their merger approved. We'll just sneak in there with Norfolk Southern and BNSF and we'll be the first transcontinental railroad. And they'll have to approve us if they approve the other ones because we are totally end to end. And they just couldn't get this idea out of their mind that they had to have Conrail. I mean, Conrail in a part of the country that was dying industrially. I mean, the best thing you could do with Conrail was get a couple of the really good main lines and run intermodal back and forth. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And, and what really disturbed me in McClellan's book, because I offered good, I said, look, I'll, you run it. You can, we'll put the headquarters in Roanoke or wherever you, and you run it. That's fine with me. It's worth, it's worth it for me to see that happen, to not step up and run the railroad. And I'm very happy to do that. And then McClellan said in the book, we just thought Krebs was kidding. He really wanted to run it, uh, which really irked me. I mean, because, I don't, I, that's not the way I act. You know, I don't tell yeah. people things that, that aren't true. <laughs> right. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, we couldn't do it. And so they had to go fight over uh, Conrail and, and, and overpay. The price of, and then they, then they shot down part of the country when they tried to break that up and put it together. Yeah, mergers are not easy. No. So then the, the last one was, uh, uh, we heard that uh, CN was going to buy KCS, and I didn't want them down here. And I just called up Tellier and said, "Okay, why don't we merge?" And so we we agreed to that, and then the whole world went to hell because uh, all the railroads came out. I picked up the Wall Street Journal, and there's all the CEOs from the other railroads, railroads who have screwed up the country by the way they handled their mergers, saying we do not want any more rail mergers, and we were the only one that really worked. Uh, and so we took that. Uh, uh, and the politicians were against it. Even UPS came out against it. And there was a big problem because when they uh, privatized um, CN, it wrote into the law that it had to be, it, headquarters always had to be in Canada. And we were gonna have to explain to the American politicians, oh yeah, I mean, this is probably one quarter of the rail system in America, but it's gonna be owned by Canadians. Um, and anyway, it just was never gonna work, but it did save, uh, the uh, CN from buying KCS. How was Mr. Tellier to deal with? Good. He was very proud. You know, they, they were cocky. He and Hunter Harrison, you know, they were, you know, they had a much better operating ratio than ours. I pointed out to them, we had a very, a much lower cost per gross ton mile, you know, of, of, uh, of hauling traffic. And I always thought that part of the reason they had such a better operating ratio is they had that clubby little group of two up there in, Can in Canada that were raising rates. And uh, I'm sure that was part of it, but he was a good guy. 
he's one we'd like to interview sometime. Yeah. And uh, he was, I think, it was, it took a lot of, uh, what do you call it, fortitude or courage to take on what he did with the political ramifications yeah. and then downsize the company and make it lean and mean because it was over, you know, bloated and yeah typical government and anything. yeah and he really he and hunter really did a good job on on that yeah um, so so fast forward okay um i decided that i had enough that i had accomplished the purpose and uh so i looked around for someone to run the, the company and uh i thought okay there's no more b and there's no more s but it would be nice if it was somebody who had been on the Burlington side of the business. And I didn't have, really have anybody who was Santa Fe. McGinnis, by that time, I think he was retired and we were too close in age anyway. And um, so I saw this guy, Matt Rose, who was uh, down in the bowels of the marketing organization. I think he had chemicals when we merged everything. He had that product line. And he made a presentation to me. I, I had all these guys come tell me about their businesses. And, and <clears throat> Rose impressed me. He impressed me because he was just ornery enough. That, that he, he, it wasn't like he was going to tell me what I wanted to hear. He was going to tell me what I needed to hear. And, uh, and yet, the people really respected him and liked working for him. And uh, he was not. It's like R.J. Miller told me one time when we were sitting at a campground somewhere and up in the Redwoods that, you know, Krebs, you are not the typical CEO. And I said, and I said, yeah, I know I'm not six foot two or three. <laughs> and, well, so I was five foot 10. Matt was probably five foot two or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he had what it takes. And uh, so I, I told the board, okay, I'm ready. I think it's time. The board really didn't want me to leave. And, um, but on the other hand, they understood that I wanted to. And I, so I just, said, here's the person I think can do the job. And I asked Matt to come see me in my office. And uh, I said, Matt, I've looked around this company. I think you're the one that can succeed me. And he said, well, I'm surprised you say that because I don't have any operating experience. And I said, well, that's great because Bundy, you are the senior vice president in charge of operations. And you did a great job there for a couple of years. And then we made him president um, and COO and he gave him a couple more staff things and then I stepped away. And the board was fine with you not doing a formal search or- Oh yeah. Any... Yeah, because I did it the right way. I mean, I introduced them to him. I, I told him ahead of time, I think this is the man that can run the company. And then they saw him in action. And so it wasn't any, any question about it. Um, so then, when would that be? I guess he- uh, he became CEO. 01? 2000. 2000. Yeah. December 7th, 2000 is my last day running BNSF. And they wanted me to stick around uh, for a year as chair. And I said, okay, I'll do it. Um, but every time I walked in the room with Matt, everybody was looking at, you know, who's running this railroad? And I finally decided the best thing I could do is disappear. And I, I told the guy who was the chair of the, of the uh, comp committee, Mike Gianni, you know, all you're doing this last year is paying me to take cruises with my wife because I just got to get out of here. And Xerox, I think, had, they had had some big deal where there was a CEO succession. I think it was Xerox. Um, and the, the CEO recommended this guy become their new CEO, and he did. And the ex CEO stayed on the board, and then got him fired. <laughs> so, so I didn't want that happening, and uh, so I retired then on May first, two thousand and one. Yeah, one day before I turned sixty. That's it. <laughs> well, not quite. Um, it says the quote that I that I read that I. Uh, when you were asked if you missed the railroad, said, no, not a bit. I walked away in 2001 and thought I'd done my job. I put together a company that was running well and found a man to replace me who's running it better. Um, that's a very, I think, gracious and, and heartfelt thought about, you know, picking the right guy. And, and Matt certainly had a stellar career there. Yep. Um, I guess my question is, you did a lot to change the industry 
in many ways in, in fixing systemic problems and the way leadership has, has I think, m moved away from the almost purely militaristic way. I mean, your, your comments about the people you were working for, it was always Mr. Biagini, Mr. So-and-so. When I was at a trainee in NNW, everybody above you was Mr. And you would, if you were in your office, you would get up and put your jacket on to go down and see anybody who outranked you. You would never think about walking in with your tie crooked or no coat on. And it was a very, almost a bit like being in the army. Um, in fact, one of the trainees had had his hair cut for the National Guard Service for summer camp. And when he got to the railroad, they told him he wasn't short enough. <laughs> so, so, so that part of the industry, I think, is it's not entirely gone, but it's largely gone. And I think, uh, you know, I think you had a key part of that. So, so one of the questions is, what about the industry changed you from, if, if you can say? Well, I, I went to I went to this you know, this uh, be in charge of everything, shoot first, aim later. To uh, being more of a manager of people, I was probably still shooting first. For I mean, at CN merger was a long shot, um, but I think I was more of a manager of people, and I I, I mellowed as time went on. So, um, two follow-up questions. One is, if you had to say this was my proudest moment or moments, what would you put on that list? Doesn't have to be one; it can be ten. But where, where, where are the things that you would like to be remembered for, or just a, in, even if you're not, just internally feel good about? Well, I already told you one of them, and that's that ride on the uh, back of the sunset. In the yeah. middle of the night with me agony. Yeah. That made it all worthwhile. Just one simple sentence, right? Yeah. 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 I can't tell you how much I enjoy this. Yeah. That's uh that's quite a compliment. Particularly from somebody who didn't throw them out like yeah, right. candy. But I guess I I mean I look I had to write the book to really understand that what I was I was right in the middle of a transformation of a dying industry into one that was the envy of every country in the world. Right. Yeah. And I was right there in the middle of it. What was interesting to me is for somebody who says, you know, I've walked away from it and I don't really think about it a lot to then write that book, which is clearly, um, it's very detailed in the process you went through, I think. And I mean, I, as somebody who spent time in the operating department, the marketing department, in the railroad business, I really related well to the challenges and the issues and so forth. So what went from, what took you from, I'm done with this, I'm retired, um, to I really want to tell this story? Well, I, I kind of said that in the introduction. Um, the, it, it was a unique experience. And it was just as sexy as Barbarian at the Gates, you know, when KKR made a run and I finally took over yeah. Nabisco, uh, Reynolds Nabisco or whatever it was. But it, it was always uh, kind of under the radar because it was just the old railroads. You know? it, was, it was, but it was, I mean, the stuff we did was just as significant as a lot of things that got a lot of publicity and this was just kind of went on. This just happened. And the end result was gratifying. Good for the country. Yeah. I gave, uh, I gave uh, the uh, Northwestern Transportation Center has a Patterson lecture every year. You know, Patterson was a CEO of, of uh, United Airlines, a legendary figure. And he gave money and they, they have somebody give a lecture every year. And so I gave one a year and I, I, I put together a bunch of slides. I showed that if you look at the efficiencies that the American rail system got and the way that rates dropped once we were deregulated over a period of time, I don't know how many years it was, maybe six or seven, that provided a $1 trillion kickstart to the American economy. It was meaningful. Yeah. Very. Yeah, it is remarkable what 
the transformation of what happened. Mm-hmm. And and it was similar in the airline and trucking industries. Once deregulation came, it changed dramatically the way industry the industry functioned. Do you have any comment on what so if you mentioned the high points, what did you feel about I probably should have started with the low points first and ended with the high points. But do you have any things that were just really troublesome? Say, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this? Well, um, the main thing was, why didn't I settle that Etsy lawsuit? <laughs> that was a billion dollar judgment. Yeah, I didn't sleep at night for a while with that. Yeah, but especially since we were leveraged to the hill, that's we just gave our shareholders a four point two billion dollar dividend. But you are listening to people who were supposed to know the law and know the the odds, and I mean, it wasn't a solo decision, I presume. No, but all I had to do was. Tell Sam Zell to go to hell and give him ten million dollars more, and life would have been some so, so much so easier. Much simpler. Were there times when you were a rookie coming up that you said, you know you're out there midnights in Roseville Yard or someplace like that, saying, "Is this is this the way life's going to be?" No, I took the job, and all that came with it. Yeah, you know, it's just that simple. Okay. Well, that's good. I think I'm out of questions. Do you have anything you want to add that we didn't cover? The one thing I didn't ask about is this house. Um, and from the standpoint of um, someone who grew up in California um, and lived all over the country to build um, this place that is museum-like in quality and reminds me of being in Italy, which I presume was influenced by your time there. Mm-hmm. Do you want to spend a little bit of time and just talk about what thinking went into it and the process of doing that and and what you're doing with the with the property? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, th- this floor that you were uh, you walk on th- those those tiles were made in Impreta, south of Florence. That stone right there in that window came from Settignano, which is uh, just above Florence, and it's where Michelangelo went out and cut stone when he was a kid. Um, you know, we always liked Italy. We always wanted to, to build a house. Um, and Anna and I have probably done t- different houses together as so we moved all the time and we rehabilitated houses. And, and, and so we, we sat down and we designed a house that we thought had a central courtyard, like a, like a palazzo would in mm-hmm. uh, Florence. Except the difference was in the palazzos in Florence, there's no window there because there's a wall right next to it and the next palazzo is right there in the center of downtown. But they all had a central courtyard. And so we kind of drew this thing up and we got an architect and we took him and his wife over to Florence twice. And uh, he drew up the house. And then the nicest thing happened when I was retiring, I didn't want a bonus. You know, I didn't want, I mean, that's why my, I always set my salary at the, at the the 20th percentile of CEO salaries because I'm not, I spent half my life, more than half my life running around telling people we got to take costs out. We got to be, you know, and so the worst thing I can do was then, you know, I'll make a lot of money. I, I sold every corridor airplane that I ever inherited. Um, but when I retired, the, the board said, We're, we want to give you some money. And I said, I don't want any money because I don't want to see it in the, uh, in the proxy statement. So we finally figured out that uh, they could uh, they could do it over two years and it wouldn't look so bad. And so they gave me five million bucks and I built this house. And uh, so we designed the house. Um, we had uh, oh, let's see, we so, so we started collecting antiques. We started buying paintings, um, and we just stored them away until the house was done. And and so now we have. The downstairs, the main big rooms are Renaissance art uh, from some pretty good painters. We have one painter that uh, I told you last night, the um, Casimo Rosselli, who uh, Vasari, when he wrote the lives of the artists during the, uh, the Renaissance, he said, uh, Cosimo Rosselli is the worst painter ever to paint in the Sistine Chapel. And <laughs> But he was painting in the Sistine Chapel. He's right. a giant he's picture. He's in, in good company. Yeah, there's a giant picture. And he's right alongside Ghirondello and Botticelli and, and uh, Perugina. And uh, so he was in good company. And, and then we started thinking, okay, well, I mean, this is something it would be worth preserving. And I always had a, a you know, warm spot in my heart for small liberal arts colleges. I was on the board of... Uh, 
Lake Forest College. I was chair of the board twice. Um, and I loved the guy who was running the place. And so I said, would you like this? And you can make it a, uh, a center for the humanities. Um, and we'll give you the house. We'll give you everything in it. And we'll give you an endowment to run it. I just got to guarantee me for 25 years, you won't sell it. <laughs> and so that's what we're ready to do. We, we, uh, we bought a lot, a house over here, which hopefully we're going to tear down about a mile away. We're going to build a nice little house. And, um, uh, then we're going to turn this over, uh, in about two years. That's a great thing to do. And I'm sure they'll be appreciative and, yeah, I think so. They're always trying to use it. Uh, we've had meetings here. They have ever, they bring a class over every, every once in a while. And it's in a perfect location for them. And, and the house is surrounded by trees. When we bought this lot, it was nothing but just a grassy field. It was owned by the people who owned the house on the other side. And so all we had to do is just plop this house down here and all these trees surrounding it. It looks like it's been here forever. Right. And it's, it's, it's insulated too. I mean, the neighbors don't even know what's going on here. And we had all kinds of problems when we first said we were going to give it to the college. Oh my God, it's going to be a co-ed dorm. Oh my God, <laughs> the, the football team is going to take this over there. You know, it's a frat a house. swimming pool in there. Gonna, yeah. Yeah. So, so we had a little trouble with that, but we, I just finally gave it to the college anyway and it'll work out just fine. Well, I know the, the Phipps mansion at the uh, University of Denver. Mm -hmm. you know, that was given to the university and they use it for fundraising, for entertaining VIPs, not huge groups by any means, but I think there's a real need for that kind of facility at a lot of universities and this would be perfect for that kind of thing. Yeah, their idea is we got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, four, we got five bedrooms. If they could bring five, maybe three or four visiting scholars and stay here and have a seminar yeah, you know, on right. the humanities and um, and, and they could have maybe a fellow, somebody maybe who's studying for a doctorate degree down at Northwestern, live here and kind of manage the house. And they could have classes come over here. They could take a couple of the rooms and put, make classrooms out of them. They probably would do it with the place where the pool table is and they do it where my exercise equipment is. And it could be the center for this, this, uh, I don't know, a center for the humanities. Yeah. It's a great thing to do with it. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time investing with us in this and, uh, and, and retelling the story that people can read a lot of in the book, but I think you added quite a bit of color to it. So, yeah, you're welcome. Happy to do it. <laughs>